All right, 3.4, we're going to be taking a look at concavity and the second derivative test. Um, you do know a bit about concavity because you've been in algebra. Um, and concavity is usually brought up for the first time in an algebra 2 class, maybe. Uh, maybe even touched on, upon in an algebra 1 class. Certainly, if you've taken college algebra pre-calc, you saw it again there. And we're going to look at it again here. Um, we're going to define it a little differently. Um, but I'll show you how it makes sense in terms of what you've seen before as well. So if we have a function that is differentiable on the interval i, the graph of f is concave up on i if f prime is increasing on i. And it's concave down if f prime is decreasing on i. So I could draw your typical sort of parabola shapes, and they fit this description, but it's easier to see that this description holds if I draw a slightly different shape that's still concave up and concave down. So those are the ones I'm going to draw instead, OK? So they work for parabolas. These are just easier to see. So if I have a graph that is concave up like this, so sort of like half of a parabola or an exponential graph, would we agree that this is concave up? Yes? OK. So the graph itself is increasing as well, but that's not what this is saying. This is saying that the derivative <coughs> is increasing. So remember, derivatives are slopes of tangent lines. So consider drawing a tangent line here and then drawing a tangent line here. Can you see how as you move from left to right, the tangent lines get steeper? Yeah. So the tangent lines are getting steeper, which means that the derivative itself, which is the slopes of the tangent lines, are also increasing on this graph. And I could likewise draw the same shape, and I could talk about decreasing derivatives like this, right? Um, and we could draw those tangent lines in here, like so. This slope of this tangent line is very big, but it's negative, right? And then over here, it is a very small negative number. Therefore, again, the slopes are increasing. They're getting less negative as you go. So that's how this is defined. And it's defined this way for a very specific reason. Um, it's defined this way because we've talked about things being increasing and decreasing in their relationship um, to um, the graphs of derivatives and original functions, and that's showing up again here. All right, so let's take a look at one more piece that's going inf to be information. This is the test for concavity. This isn't the second derivative test. We'll get there in a minute. This is a test for concavity. And this shows why we want the definition that we had previous for our definition for concavity. If we have a second derivative, which we've looked at but just briefly, if we have a second derivative that exists and the second derivative is positive, then the graph is concave up. And if the second derivative is negative, the graph is concave down. Now that actually feels like something we did in section 3.3. We looked at things being positive and then defining something for us. In particular, if something was positive, namely, the um, derivative was positive, then we ended up having a graph that was increasing. And if a derivative was negative, then the graph was decreasing. So this is a similar statement. It's just about second derivatives. And it comes straight from here, right? What do we have to do to decide if something is increasing? Well, we take its derivative and we find out if it's positive. So this statement right here, f prime, oh, that was supposed to be a highlighter. Let's try it again. f prime is increasing is the same statement as saying the derivative of that, which is the second derivative, is positive. And on the second one, f prime is decreasing, is the same thing as saying that the derivative of that, which is f double prime, is negative. That's why we want it defined that way, is so that we can then use the test for concavity on the next slide here in a very simple way. Now I say simple. Uh, it's simple conceptually. We just take a derivative twice. Sometimes it's easy to do. Polynomials are really easy to take derivatives of. Uh, generally speaking, trig functions are pretty easy to take derivatives of because they sort of cycle themselves, right? They, they do this recycling kind of thing throughout. Um, but if it's got chain rules and product rules, things can get you know, harder. So it's not always that straightforward. But the concept is going to be pretty straightforward. In order to find out about something being concave up or concave down, I need to figure out what the second derivative is doing. So we're going to start with polynomial. Because again, like I said, it's a very straightforward process. Okay? So it wants us to determine where the graph is concave up and concave down. And with the exception of the fact that I'm going to take the second derivative, everything else is going to look like what we did in the last section. Okay? So 
first derivative. What is the first derivative for problem number one? 4x cubed minus 12x plus 2. Okay, everybody good with that? All right, polynomials, we like polynomials. The second derivative is even friendlier when we're working with polynomials because we don't have to do anything more complicated. What's the second derivative here? 12x squared minus 12. Okay, everybody good with that? All right, so again, I had to do a second derivative, but after that, everything works the same as it did back in section 3.3. We set the second derivative now equal to zero, and we solve. And then we set up a sign chart, and we test intervals. All the same. So where will this equal zero? Well, you can do it one of two ways. You can factor if you'd like. That's how I'll show it. You can move the 12 to the other side, and you can take a square root. That's fine, too. So I'm going to show mine with factoring. If I take out a 12, I have x squared minus 1. And how does x squared minus 1 factor? x plus 1, x minus 1. Mm -hmm. x plus 1, x minus 1. All right, so if you were taking the 12 to the other side right here, right, dividing by 12 and then square rooting, you'd have that plus or minus. So there's that plus or minus 1 coming out. So we end up getting that this is x equal negative 1 and positive 1. There are two... Um, they aren't called critical points, but they're acting like the critical points did in the previous section. There's actually not a name for them. I wish there were, um, but there's not. So we're going to draw them on a number line. This part's the same. Put them in order, of course. And we want to test points in these intervals. So what would you like to test before negative 1? Negative 2. Between negative 1 and 1. Zero. Always like testing 0. And after 1? Might as well test two. And what are we going to test them in? The derivative. Okay, it's a good question, right? Because we've tested things in lots of places. We're going to test them in the second derivative. Okay? The second derivative over here is what tells us if something's concave up or concave down. So we're going to test it in the second derivative. Okay? So if we evaluate negative 2 into this function right here, Right? And neg do negative 2 squared, multiply by 12, 12, and then subtract 12. Do I get a positive or do I get a negative? Positive. I get a positive. What if I put in 0? Negative. negative. And if I put in positive 2? Positive. positive again. Now, what I did in the previous section is I drew these sort of lines, right? So positive meant increasing, negative meant decreasing, and I drew like line segments showing that. That's not what they mean here. What does a positive second derivative mean? Concave it's concave up. So while it may not actually be a full parabola, I usually, whoops, I usually kind of draw these shapes in to remind myself what's happening. Because for me, seeing a parabola shape being concave up or concave down is a real quick reminder of what's happening there. If you don't want to draw those in, it doesn't matter. But it's a way to sort of think about it visually. And then we're going to actually list our intervals of concavity. So we have concave up, and those are my positives. So we'll start on the far left. This will be negative infinity to negative 1. And then I jump over here to positive 1, and I'll have 1 to infinity. And then I'll have it concave down where? Negative 1 to 1. Mm -hmm. negative one, to 1. You got it. And interval notation is what they typically will use. Okay. Does that feel the same pretty much as what we did before? It, it really does. The only difference is that we're taking a second derivative before we do the same process we did last time. Okay. All right, I think we have another one. Oh, no, we have a definition. All right, these places where it changes from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up do have a name. Now, these locations where they set equal to zero are not always that name because it doesn't have to have changed concavity. It's just potentially changing concavity, right? right that, that can happen. It doesn't have to have changed concavity. But if it does change concavity at those points, those points are called inflection points. So we're supposing that f is continuous on the interval a, b, and it changes concavity at that point. That is to say it's concave down on one side, concave up on the other. If that happens, we have something called an inflection point. 
Now our last problem had two inflection points. We didn't find the point, we just found the x values, negative two and positive two, but there were two locations, I'm sorry, it was one, wasn't it? Negative one and positive one. There were two locations where I did have inflection points. I would just need to find the corresponding y value that goes with it to call it a point, right? Because points are ordered pairs. But I did have two locations of inflection points in the last problem. So in general, what we're looking for when we're looking for an inflection point is we're looking for a place where the second derivative is equal to zero or the second derivative doesn't exist. Those are two possible places. And again, typically the equaling zero part's what's happening, not the does not exist, although it could be. And we could have a does not exist and it work, but the generally it's the, does, the equaling zero part that happens. Now, that doesn't mean that just because the second derivative equals zero, it's always an inflection point. It's just a possible inflection point. It's a place for us to check and see. If I don't have a second derivative equal to zero, then it's not an inflection point at all. That's not possible. Right, so it's a necessary condition but it's not a sufficient condition. It's not enough for sure, but it's absolutely crucial that that happens for us to have one. So we're gonna find an inflection point here. Um, we do have the ability, if you wish, to multiply this out, right? This is a cubic, it's not impossible. You could multiply that out if you would like. Um, and then you could take your derivatives of polynomials. Since we've already done a derivative of a polynomial, I'm not gonna do it that way, but there's nothing wrong with doing it that way, okay? So if you saw this and you were like, cubic, I can multiply that out three times. That's cool, I can do that. Uh, but you can't distribute the cube. Like That's not a thing. Y'all know what I'm saying, right? If you multiply that out, you're multiplying x minus four times x minus four times x minus four, okay? So in order to see another option, and in some cases it's not a possibility, like if that had said x minus three, to, or x minus four to the power of seven, you're not multiplying it out, right? You're not gonna do that. Let's actually look at doing this from a product and chain rule perspective instead, okay? So can you see the product part of it? You have the x multiplied by something else with x in it. Can you see the chain part of it? Got the power on one portion of it, okay? So it overall is a product rule though, because we have these two pieces. It's just that we have a chain in the second piece as well. So we're going to take, how many derivatives? Two. two. So let's start with the first one. So taking the first derivative, you want one of the pieces to remain the same. I usually leave my first one the same, and then I take the derivative of the second one. Taking the derivative of the second one is a chain rule. So we bring the three down, we rewrite the inside, and we decrease the power by one. And this chain's actually really nice because what's the derivative of the inside? One. It's just one. I'm gonna write it in, but feel free to leave it off if you don't wanna see it. It's half of it. Then we're gonna do the other piece. Now I need the derivative of x, that's also one. Again, write or don't write. And then I have the x minus three, I'm sorry, x minus four cubed. Um, your best bet is probably to clean it up even if just a little bit before you go take in another derivative here, all right? I mean, there's no reason to have all these parentheses, there's no reason to have the extra ones that I put in. So if you put them in as well, you might want to take one step to just clean it up a little bit. I'd rewrite this as 3x. I have x minus 4 to the power of 2. And then I just have an x minus 4 cubed <coughs> over here. So just cleaning up a little bit is usually helps to simplify the process for the second derivative. Now there's other things you could do to simplify this or to clean it up if you wanted to. You could factor out the x minus 4 squared. Um, but you don't have to. There's nothing helpful necessarily in it. Um, there's nothing harmful in it either. It's probably not gonna create more work. It's probably not gonna create less work, right? So it, I, I tend to not try to do any extra work that I need to, so I'm gonna leave mine. Um, and we're gonna take second derivative. Now when I take my second derivative, I do still have a product rule. The first piece is a product rule, right? With the chain rule, just like the last one. It's almost the same, in fact. Um, the second piece, though, is just a chain rule, yeah? Okay. So on the first one, I'll rewrite the first piece, 3x, and then I'll take the derivative, which means pulling the two down, rewriting the x minus four to the power of one. The derivative of the inside's one. And then we have the second piece of the product rule. What's the derivative of three x? Three. Three. And then I rewrite the x minus four to the power of two. 
And then I'm gonna simplify or take the derivative of the second piece, that is this piece right here. So I'm gonna bring my three down. I'm gonna rewrite the x minus four to the power two, and derivative of the inside's a one. Okay, you're starting to get a feel for why we worked so hard on derivatives before. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is still a mess <laughs> at this point, but there's some pieces that we could combine if we simplify. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna attempt to do that. Um, so in the first piece, uh, we have six x, and then I have x minus four, which I'll probably multiply through in a minute, but just hold tight for that. Um, let's see, the next one I have three times x minus four squared, but then I have another three times x minus four squared, right? So this one says x minus four squared, and this one says x minus four squared. So I can combine them, because they're like terms. They both have the x minus four squareds in them. So I really just have six times x minus four here squared. And over here I have a six x and an x minus four. Now there's two options, and um, they both will work. Um, I do think there's one that's a little bit harder than the other, so I'm gonna go with the easier approach. Um, one option is that we can multiply everything out, combine like terms. I think that's the harder approach. Um, generally speaking, it's the harder approach because we end up with powers that might not be quadratic. On this one, we'd still end up with quadratics. I don't have any powers of x cubed or higher coming through with I do, when I do that. But generally speaking, I could. Okay, it would definitely be a possibility. Um, instead, because I'm going to have to factor it later anyway, I would be more inclined to notice that each have an x minus 4 in them and to go ahead and start the factoring to begin with. So since they both have an x minus 4, I'm going to pull the x minus 4 to the front, which leaves me with a 6x from the first piece, right? And then from this piece, I have a 6 and I have an x minus 4. So I have plus six, and I still have one of the x minus fours attached to that plus six. All right, so I'm factoring without ever having distributed everything, which cut at least one step out of the process, which is helpful. And then from here, so here's that x minus four, I have six x plus six x minus 24 which gives me 12x minus 24. You're welcome to leave that as 12x minus 24. You're welcome to factor the 12 out of it if you prefer. Okay, mine has a parenthesis here, it'll show up in a minute. Um, so if you, there it is. Um, so if you wanna factor um, the 12 out of this, that's totally cool. Um, if you wanna set these both equal to zero and then divide the 12 out of it, that's fine too. It doesn't make any difference. Um, but once I get the second derivative into this form, and the reason I'm wanting it in this form is because I really want to do is to set this equal to zero. But unless I have a linear function, it's generally not able to just be separated on two sides, divide and conquer, right? I can't do that. I usually have to factor. So I've attempted to factor as I go, and we have achieved that at the end, where we can actually set each piece equal to zero. So if I set x minus four equal to zero, what's x? Four. If I set 12x minus 24 equal to zero, what's x? Two. two. So these are the two values that I get out of this. And you will be able to, I mean, if you decide, or if you don't even, maybe you just don't even notice that you could have factored out an x minus four, you're gonna get x equals two and x equals four another way as well. Like it's not gonna be impossible. You could even use quadratic formula if you're so inclined. Distribute it all out, use quadratic formula if you don't wanna factor it, that's fine. It'll still work, okay? So there's more than one way to, to tackle this problem. However, at this, part, at this point, we have the sign chart like we did before. Now, this question asks us to find points of inflection, which we didn't find on the last one, although we talked about having it done, we could have done it looking backwards. And it says to discuss the concavity. So the concavity part of it means that I definitely need this sign chart in order to say concave up, concave down. But I kind of need the sign chart anyway with the tools we have so far because I don't know that I have inflection points at two and four. I mean, they're possible inflection points, but I don't know that right now. I have to verify that using a sign chart of whether they are or they are not. So I have a two and I have a four on here and I need to test points in and around those values. So what would I test or what could I test before two? What, one, okay, or zero is fine too. We'll put one since you mentioned one. How about between two and four? 
three is good, and after four, I'd go with five as well. So those are good choices. And where are we going to test those points? In the second derivative, and we have lots of places where we could put them in, correct? Um, so if you want to pick one, that's fine. I'm probably inclined to go with my very last one at this point, because to me, I think that's probably the cleanest one to put it into. Um, but feel free to choose any of those locations that you'd like um, and check it out. So um, I didn't have my screen to be able to do this last time. I didn't have my calculator, so I'll do it on this one. Um, you guys did fine on the one before, um, but we'll turn it on here too, just a reminder in case anybody um, hasn't seen it in a moment. So I'm going to put the um, factored one in to y equals... I'm going to put in x minus 4 and 12x minus 24. Okay, does that look okay? Might be a little bit better. Not all the way over there, but that's okay. Okay, uh, and then I would go into my table. You can go into your table by hitting second and graph. And I'm going to put in the values you picked, which were 1, 3, <coughs> and, oops, not 4, it's 5. <coughs> One, three, and five. Um, and again, I don't care what the number value is. I care what the sign is. So the first one's positive. The second one is negative, And the third one is positive. Okay, so based on that information, I've written it on my screen. Positive, negative, positive. And as a reminder to myself, I'm going to put in those parabola shapes that recognize the concavity of what's going on. Positive is up, negative is down, okay? So let's talk about concavity first. Where is this concave up? Okay, and although both of our examples really have changed concavity, and both of our examples have been up, down, up, that's just because of what they are. That doesn't always happen, okay? So don't think that there's sort of a pattern hidden here. There's not. Uh, concave down, then, would be between them, right? Two to four. Okay, we do need to identify the points of inflection. I mentioned that at the top, right? So my points of inflection are going to be at this number two and this number four, but those are the x values of the points of inflection. So I've got points, whoops, 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 try that again. Points of inflection. Um, and one of them is at 2, and the other one is at 4 for an x value. But points are ordered pairs, x, y, and these are my x values. So how do I find the y that goes with them? Put them into somewhere. The original. Yeah, so the original tells us what's actually happening in terms of the original graph, the point itself. If we put it in the derivative, we would be able to find out whether it's increasing or decreasing. Right? That's what, incre what the first derivative tells us. And then the second derivative tells us our concavity. If we try to plug these into the second derivative, we'll get zero, because that's what a point of inflection does. So we're going to put them into the original function. So what I really want to find out from up here, that's not where I was meaning to point to here, is I want to find f of 2, and I want to find f of 4. So take a moment either to do it by hand or to do it your calculator. What happens when you put in 2? Two? 2 is the harder of these numbers to do. It's force, force clean and easy. Negative 16. Negative 16. And what happens when we put in 4? It actually gives me a 0, yeah. So my points of inflection are 2, negative 16, and four, zero. Now, we didn't look at a graph of the last one, but I'd like for us to look at a graph of this one just so you can see that what you are writing down with calculus here really matches what your image is doing. So let's look at the calculator screen um, on this graph real quick to make that connection. Come on. There it is. So right now my derivative, the second derivative is in there. That's not what I want. I want the original graph. So I've got x times x minus 4 to the third. 
Um, I know my to the third power probably looks a little bit different than yours, but that's okay. Um, and then we want, I'm just gonna do a standard window. I don't know if it's gonna work well in that window, but we're gonna try it. So I'm just gonna do zoom, and number six is my standard window, and I can manipulate it if I need to. Um, I might need to a little bit. I kind of like to see a little further down here, so I'm gonna make my window go a little further down. So instead of a y min of negative 10, let's try negative 20. I can try it and see what that works. Uh, not too bad. I don't need this side of the graph at all, so I'm going to actually stretch my graph out a little bit too. So I'm gonna make my window start at just say ne negative two over here. And maybe go down a little bit further. It still wasn't quite enough, so let's go negative 30. See what happens. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay, so on this graph, can you see, um, well, I, let me point to it. Okay, right in here, you can see this is concave up, and that roller spot right there seems like it changes, and now it's concave down for a period. And this point's very interesting. It's changing right at that point, right, from being concave down to concave up, right on the x-axis. And that point, if we were to trace over there, would be at x equal to 2, and this point right here is at, I'm sorry, 4, x equal to 4, and this point right here is at x equal to 2. So it is matching what we're intending to happen. Not only that, but it does in fact say that when I put in 2, I should be getting something negative. And if you remember what I did my screen at, I ended up going down to negative 30. And this looks like it's pretty close to halfway down. So negative 16 seems like a reasonable value to have gotten for negative 2. And this one is definitely happening on the x-axis. So x equals 4 gave me the 0 for y. And that is, in fact, going to be the x-intercept. Okay? So you should be able to get confirmation from looking at your graph that this is what's happening as well. All right. So the other part of our directions said, get it to come on up, there it is. The other part of our directions, uh, not directions, title of our section said, uh, second derivative tests, right? So we haven't done that yet. We've done second derivatives, but we haven't done the second derivative test. And I will warn you that um, people always confuse second derivative test with this test for concavity. They are not the same thing. Test for concavity uses second derivatives, but it is not the second derivative test, okay? The second derivative test actually tells us information about increasing and decreasing functions, or maxes and mins, correspondingly. So it actually tells us that if you have a function where the derivative is zero, okay, we've done that before. We've had functions where the derivative is zero. That's what we did in 33. And the second derivative exists. So that's new, we didn't talk about second derivatives back in 3.3, but the second derivative does, exists. Then if your second derivative is negative, you have a local maximum. And if your second derivative is positive, you have a local minimum. Now think about what that means. Second derivative being negative, right? That's the sign that I was drawing like this before, right, when I was drawing my image. Can you see the maximum when I draw that? Yeah, it's, it's right here. This is my maximum. And if my second derivative is positive, right, we draw it like that, then we can see that minimum coming out. So it doesn't tell us, it uses concavity to tell us maxes and minimums. It doesn't find for us the concavity for the whole function. It finds for us maximums and minimums, which is about graphs being, um, using which is akin to what the first derivative test found for us. Let me say it that way. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. We're going to do one that's got a little bit messier of a derivative because we haven't done one yet, right? All right, so on this one, in a rational function, the directions say to find the relative extrema and to use the second derivative test where applicable. Okay, so the second derivative test says I need to find where the First derivative is equal to zero, not the second. The first derivative is equal to zero, okay? So that's what we're gonna do first. We're gonna find the first derivative set equal to zero. So this one is a rational function. You can do it with quotient rule if you'd like, right? It's quotient, you can do that. 
Or you could rewrite it if you prefer, like this, and do it with a product rule. So I'm going to let you guys tell me what you want to do. Neither one's easier or harder. So which one do you want to do? Do you want to do a product rule or do you want to do a quotient rule? Quotient rule. Thank you for making a decision for us. We're going to do a quotient rule. So we're not going to do it from this perspective, although you can if you prefer. All right, so quotient rule says low d high. So low x d high, derivative of the top. What's the derivative of this numerator? 2x minus high, whoops, minus, minus high, x squared plus 1. D low, what's the derivative of my denominator? 1. All over low, low. So x squared. Okay, now it's the second derivative equaling to 0 um, that we're looking for. We really don't need the second derivative not existing to work here. Uh, because of the second, not second derivative, excuse me, the first derivative. If the first derivative does not equal, actually, we'll set it up. We'll set it up so you can see. It usually doesn't work out that way, but we'll set it up. So we were looking for the second derivative, the first derivative to equal zero or to not exist, which is what we did back in section 3.3. Okay, so this part's the same as section 3.3. Um, let's clean up the numerator a little bit. So the first piece, I have 2x squared, and then I have minus x squared plus 1 all over, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right, minus 1, minus 1, if we distribute the negative through, and all over x squared. Uh, 2x squared minus x squared gives me an x squared on top minus 1, and I have x squared on bottom. So if I set the top equal to 0, the whole thing will equal 0. If I set the bottom equal to 0, it means it does not exist. So what x value does the denominator equal to 0? That's the easy one to see. Zero. Yeah, when x is zero, my denominator is zero, and the whole thing doesn't exist. How about the numerator? It's not zero. I want the whole numerator to equal zero, but if I let x equal zero, the numerator doesn't equal zero. Yeah, positive or negative one. You might just be able to see that one just by looking. Most of you commented and saw that. If not, set it equal to zero and solve it. You know, longhand, that's fine too. So there are three values here that are potential places that we could have um, maximums or minimums, right? Now, if we did the first derivative test, we'd use these three values, we'd set up a sign chart, we'd test three intervals, right? That's the first derivative test. It's not the second derivative test. The second derivative test says, okay, so we're gonna take a second derivative now. So we're gonna take the second derivative. So this is, this is in lieu of, right? Instead of doing a sign chart, we do this. So we take our second derivative. Now, if it were polynomial, we'd all be happy to take the second derivative. We're less happy because it's a rational function. Um, but we're going to do it with this one anyway. It's going to be just fine, I promise. So since we did the product rule before, we'll do the product, I'm sorry, the chain rule before. I'm still not using the right word. The quotient rule before. Since we did the quotient rule before, we're going to use the quotient rule again with this one. So low d high, so low is x squared. What's the derivative of my numerator now? 2x minus high, so that's x squared minus 1. D low, what's the derivative of the denominator? 2x. 2x, yeah. Over the denominator squared, which would give me x to the fourth. So let's clean up the numerator a little bit. Um, so this is 3x cubed, I'm sorry, 2x cubed. And then I have a minus 2x squared cubed, 2x cubed again, and then negative negative makes a positive 2x, and all of this is over x to the fourth. So what do you notice about the 2x cubes? They cancel. So I'm merely left with 2x on top, x to the fourth on bottom, and that will simplify to what? 2 over x cubed. Okay, is that all right? Uh, even if you don't simplify anything in the denominator, you could continue. So if you left it at 2x over x to the fourth, it'd be okay. Because that's not my question. My question isn't find the second derivative. My question is to use the second derivative to do something. So either of these versions of the second derivative at the end are very usable. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find out, according to the second derivative test, if those points... 1, negative 1, and 0 
give me a positive or a negative second derivative? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So I'm trying to evaluate f double prime at negative 1, f double prime at positive 1, and f double prime at 0. So I'm going to be putting negative 1, positive 1, and 0 into this equation that I got at the end. So what happens when I put in, and again, all I care about is the sign. I don't care about the value. But if I put in a negative 1 into 2 over x cubed, will I get a positive or a negative? I will get a negative. If I put in a 1 into 2 over x cubed, I'll get a positive. And if I put in 0 into 2 over x cubed, I get a it does not exist. Yeah, this one does not exist. So there's no, we, we don't have any information that it's in the, it's not a max room in, is what we actually know. It's not one. Uh, and I think you probably know what's happening at x equal to 0. Do you remember? There's an asymptote. Look at the original function, right? x equals 0 is an asymptote. So it's definitely not going to be a max room in, which is what I was alluding to when I said you can kind of ignore the fact that the does not exist isn't going to help you in this um, because you've got an asymptote there. These other two points tell you something, though. Negative means it's concave down. Positive means it's concave up. So when I have a concave down graph, do I have a max or a min? I have a max. This point tells me I have a max. And if I have a concave up graph, I have a min. Now, that doesn't tell me the actual point. <laughs> It only tells me the x values. Sometimes that's all you're asked to find. That would be fine. Uh, I believe that this one says find relative extrema, which means they want, we're going to say that they want the x and the y's. So what we have found here is that at 1 and at negative 1, we have certain things. 1 was a minimum. Negative 1 is a maximum. Did I get those right? And how can I find the corresponding y value that's supposed to go in that ordered pair set? Put it in the original. Put it in the original function. You got it, Elijah. OK, so here's my original function up here, right? all of this. So let's try to put these in. Uh, if I put in 1, I have 1 squared plus 1. So what's that give me on top? 2 over 1. So that's going to give me 2. If I put in negative 1, I have negative 1 squared which is 1, plus 1 is 2, but the bottom is going to be negative 1. So 2 divided by negative 1 gives me negative 2. And if you don't want to do it by hand or if the function is more complicated, feel free to grab your calculator and plug it in. That's fine. These are my relative extrema, and there are no sign charts. So if you would, put a note to yourself here that says, in this method, there are no sign charts. You'll have a quiz question asking you to do this at some point, most likely, right? You'll possibly have a test question asking you to do this at some point. And because of the fact that it says second derivative, sometimes people get it confused with the concavity issue and they start answering questions about concavity. Or they get confused about the fact that it's saying maxes and mins, and so they do a first derivative test with sign charts. This one's unique. It combines pieces or elements of both of those into the single, the single test. Okay, we have one more, a trig one. It's got an interval. That's pretty typical. We see intervals a lot when we're given trig functions. It wants us to find all relative extrema and use the second derivative test. So same directions as the last one, right? Same directions set on your paper. And so we start with doing what? What's our first step? Find the derivative. I'm going to find my derivative. So what is the derivative of sine of x over 2? It's been over a week since I've done trig with you. Cosine x over 2. Okay, so it's cosine of x over 2. That's where it's going to start. Times 1 half. And then times 1 half. And I'm going to put the 1 half in front just so we don't confuse it and think we can multiply it by the x over 2. Okay, it's chain rule, right? Derivative of the sine is the cosine. And then the derivative of the x over 2 is the 1 half in front. Is everybody good with that? Okay. What's the second step? I've got a derivative now. Set it equal to zero, you bet. Write yourself a list of steps if it helps you. Set it equal to zero. 
Um, setting this equal to zero means that the one half at the beginning is irrelevant, right? Because that doesn't change where something's equal to zero. Um, I want to know where the cosine of x over two is equal to zero. In particular, we might want to start by just thinking about the cosine of x. Okay, so where on a number line, or not a number line, but a um, unit circle, do I have a cosine value that's equal to zero? Okay, pi over two and three pi over two are values where cosine is equal to zero. Is that good with everybody? Okay, so we have a potential, the location where the cosine is equal to two is that it's equal to two at pi over two and three pi over two. And we could keep going around and around. This is sufficient, so I'll stop. That's the angle, right? But my angle is not just x. My angle is x over two. So what would I have to figure? What would I have to do to figure out what x is? Yeah, I'll multiply by two. I need to solve for x. So far, I've always I've only solved for the angle, right? And if I multiply this by two, my x value gives me what? Or my answer then gives me what for x? Pi and three pi. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, we won't because notice what would happen if we did it again, if we went further. Um, so I'll show you what would happen. If you do, it's not going to hurt anything. You're just going to get values that are not going to end up working. So five pi over two, I'll stop there. And notice that if I do that and multiply here, I get five pi. And now I'm outside of my interval. Yeah. So if you go too far, it's not going to hurt anything. You'll notice when you get to this point, oh, look, now that's too big. Does everybody see why five pi is too big at this point? My interval is zero to four pi. So that's a really good question though, um, Ian, but it just depends on the interval and the values you're looking at. Um, and so if you go too far, you'll know. Okay, so we have two locations, right? Uh, pi and three pi. That's when my derivative is equal to zero. Now what? Second derivative, right? So now I'm ready to do the second derivative. So what is the second derivative when my first derivative is one half cosine pi or x over two? Still got a one half. What's the derivative of cosine? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put a parenthesis here so that it doesn't look like subtraction. Please do a parenthesis or a dot, one of the two. Negative sine of x over two. And then what do I have to do? Multiply by half again, right? The derivative of the x over two is one half. So we'll clean it up a little bit. I'm gonna move the negative to the front. I'm gonna move the one half with the one half that's in front together. So I have one fourth. And then this is sine of x over two. Are we okay with the cleanup? Now what do I do? Right, I'm going to use those values that I just got up here and substitute them into the second derivative. So I want to find f double prime of pi and I want to find f double prime of three pi. So I have negative one fourth at the beginning and again, the sign is what I'm concerned about, right? The sign, uh, not as in this sign, but like the positive or negative sign. Uh, and I have pi over and the other one is negative one-fourth sine of three pi over two. All right, so pi over two, I'm at the top of my circle. What is my sine value at the top of the circle? It's a positive one, right? So I have the positive one. So this piece right here is positive one times a negative one-fourth, which gives me a negative. Again, the sine is what I care about. Oops, I'm sorry, I've gone the wrong line. Let's shift it up. Here we go. Okay, first one. So this is one times my negative one fourth. I've got a negative. What is the sine of three pi over two? 
that's actually negative one, right? It's negative. And then this negative is multiplied by the negative one fourth, giving me a positive. Negative means I'm concave down. Positive means concave up. So at pi over two, do I have a max or a min? Max. I have a max. And at three pi over two, or at, not pi over two, but at three uh, at pi, I have a max. At three pi, do I have a max or a min? I have a min. So I have a max at pi something, and I have a min at three pi something, according to what I've written down so far. So far, so good? And what do I do to get the output, the y value? Put into the original equation. So way back up here at the beginning, which happens to be sine as well, right? Cyclic nature of things, right? I want to find out what is the function value itself at pi and the function value itself at 3 pi. So what is the sine of pi? And then it's over 2 because the angle is x over 2. What's the sine of pi over 2? 1. And what's the sine of 3 pi over 2? Negative 1. So down here, we're at 1 and at negative 1. And let's just confirm one more time with the calculator that this makes sense, especially because some of you are less comfortable with trig than you are with polynomials. And so it's a good thing for us to be checking our work as we go. So we're going to put in the original function that we were given, which was the sine of x over 2. Um, there's actually a feature that's called trig. So I'm going to do a zoom trig. So it's zoom 7, which is z trig. Um, the reason that that's a nice feature is because it actually puts them into pi half intervals. So like this one right here is at um, either, uh, let's see what our window goes to. Yeah, it's between two pi. So this one right here is at pi halves. This is at pi. This is at three pi halves. This is at two pi. Um, I don't want my window to do this, though. I want my window to actually go from 0 to 4 pi. So I'll do that, and then I'll hit graph, and it'll shift it. So what you should be able to see then here is that this one right here is pi halves. This is pi. And at pi, we have a max. That's what we wrote down, right? Mm -hmm. And can you see that the corresponding y value is at 1? Yeah. And over here, we have at this one right here is at 3 pi. And at 3 pi, we have a min, and the corresponding y value is at negative 1. So you should be able to confirm these. Now, I will tell you, if all you do is you look at your calculator and you answer the questions, you're probably going to be able to do just fine on your web assign. Probably not going to be able to do anything on your tests or quizzes, right? So practice to doing it with the calculus. That's the point. We're leading up to something where it's not going to be so easy to do with your calculator. In fact, it's not always so easy as this one to see it on the calculator anyway, right? But the calculator can give us a good confirmation of what's going on. All right, that's it for 3-4.